Hey everyone, this is a vulnerable code. Vulnerable code exists because we don't believe vulnerability database should be just about vulnerabilities. First of all, I am your co-host, Rithik Vijay. I'm uh, very much interested into Linux and information security. That's the project Vulnerable Code. And uh, I have been working on Vulnerable Code for over a year now via Google Summer of Code and uh, now independently. These are my details. And you can contact me on Twitter and by me. Hey, everyone. My name is Tushar Goyal. Uh, I am a co-maintainer at Vulnerable Code, Fetch Code uh, Universe and package URL. And I'm currently working as a software engineer at NextP. Uh, I have been mentoring at Google Summer of Code and also a previous participant there. Uh, you can uh, contact me via the email ID you can see right here. So let's go with the uh, agenda for today's talk. Well, we'll talk about the state of uh, all the vulnerability databases, uh, including the open source ones and the, the closed source ones. How do they search and uh, how do we search? Well, we don't believe that a vulnerability database should be just about vulnerabilities. So there's a hint right out for you. We'll talk about uh, a better approach, talk about vulnerable code and how they develop vulnerable code, the ideas behind it, and our future plan of the, of the project. But let's begin with the state of vulnerability databases. But right now, during our research, we have seen a lot of databases with host packages. This means that the packages uh, just don't exist, but there have been adversaries for that package. So we get uh, XYZ is uh, infected with vulnerability ABC, but uh, there is no reference for that package uh, XYZ. Sometimes it happens that the package XYZ exists, but the version vulnerable does not exist at all. We have a very, uh, we have a problem of crying wolf as well, where, uh, a package would uh, be treated as vulnerable, even if uh, it's one vulnerability is, uh, lies only inside one of its dependencies. So a vulnerability scanner should not uh, just uh, include that entire package as a vulnerable, a vulnerable uh, entity. The vulnerability scanner need to pinpoint which particular dependency is vulnerable. That is important because uh, the package uh, developers want to uh, improve the package and uh, that can only be done if you know how to uh, detect vulnerabilities in your dependencies itself. Some version ranges do not agree amongst themselves. At times uh, you say it's greater than two and it's uh, less than one. It does not make sense. There could not be any versions uh, in such adversaries and uh, there are uh, a lot of noises in uh, adversaries as well. For example, uh, you will have uh, an adversary that says every version after 1.3 is vulnerable. When that is not the case, what happens is at the time of publishing the adversary, the vulnerability was identified. So it must have been fixed after that. But sometimes we are left with open and vulnerable ranges. And uh, that does not help at all and creates a lot of noise. Now we have CDs where we have a vulnerability map, but it's not very easy to find out which exact package is vulnerable to a particular uh, vulnerability or a bug. This brings up to a very interesting uh, problem. We call it the telephone game problem. Well, this is a game that is played in uh, various places of the world where uh, you start with a person and uh, they listen something and uh, the person conveys uh, whatever they listen to the next person and so on and so forth. Well, a similar thing happens with the case of vulnerability data as well. 
there is a lot of reliance on automated tools. We have a lot of bad data. And everyone at every step makes something up with the data that they have. So uh, a database A based their content on database B. And if uh, the initial database was not uh, correct to begin with, all the database gets corrupted down the line. Even further, they alter the data. Sometimes uh, they convert version ranges from uh, near numbers or uh, op operators to English, English sent sentences, which sometimes just does not make sense and uh, is not possible at all. This implies that as many database interpretations you have, you will have as many version ranges. And uh, this boils the entire data. And this turns over time into a telephone game, where at the end, the message that uh, upstream wanted to convey has totally been changed. You don't get the exact version ranges and uh, you are unable to parse any uh, package or maybe find any vulnerability inside any package uh, and pinpoint uh, the uh, versions that are vulnerable. Well, all in all, what we find is upstream has the better data. If we want to trust anyone, we have to trust upstream, the one who published the vulnerability. And uh, that's how we tackle this problem. Here you can see uh, this picture can be uh, interpreted in um, many, many uh, thoughts. Like the best data is upstream. We have to. Uh, Tackle the problem, whatever comes uh, along our way, but we got to find that sweet upstream data that lies behind this layer. Moving on, we have uh, databases which are proprietary, and uh, we have no idea what secret sauce they use to get the vulnerability data. It is a, uh, it is very painful to not to know how. The data that you are consuming has uh, emerged in the uh, outside world. If it's a false code, the vulnerability data should be open as well. Everyone should know how the vulnerability data was aggregated. Everyone should know what are the steps involved, and uh, there should not be any secret sauce. It should be as transparent as as follows. Well, we have something that's. Uh, Great thing over here. We have GHS space, OSP, GitLab. All of them are publishing open data, open vulnerability data. And uh, that is a giant step towards uh, making the vulnerability data a better uh, place. Package URL that we have talked about in a different presentation on uh, this uh, channel has uh, been, has, is been uh, getting traction. And uh, we are getting one package URL, which is very consistent with uh, the uh, affected uh, package or the vulnerable package or fixed packages. We also, uh, that package URL has also been used at OSB, Sonatide, OSS Index, and we have common formats for inoperability. Yeah. Uh, how do we search? Right. Uh, we are package first. We uh, so, uh, we have a package foo that at version one, we want to know what vulnerabilities are associated with that package. So we check what are the vulnerabilities, what are the severities attached to that vulnerability and which version has a fix for that vulnerability. Right. And it's a very rare case that we face that you have a vulnerability and you want to check how uh, do you have any package that is associated to that vulnerability? So a better approach is package first. You don't need to look up to vulnerabilities to find packages, but you need to be package first and find packages and look up to vulnerabilities. So yeah, why vulnerable code? Uh, we are accurate and correct. Uh, so vulnerabilities are important. They are very important, but code is more important. We, you need to be packaged first. There is no free software vulnerability database that is number one. 
open. Most of the solutions that we find are proprietary or closed source. Number two, it should be comprehensive. And it should be covering most ecosystems. It should be created by uh, expert humans. It should be validated. And most importantly, it should be working towards correctness. So wonderful put solution. Yeah. Uh, we leverage all the tools that report package URL, and we also support CPTs. And the tools that we have currently here are scanco.io, toolkit, ORT, turn, and a bunch of these you can, as you can read on the screen. So you can query with Perl, like uh, as Rithik and Philippe has talked about Perls. So I think you have got a lot of context to what Perls, how, what are package URLs and how you can reuse them. So we support queries by Perl and open data and open source tools are always better. Like you, you know what, what's, what's going behind them, right? And you're not confused what, what could be the consequences of the closed source parts. And yeah, eventually we'll be having expert review and uh, in the curation of data. Well, we talked about a solution that is vulnerable code, and which um, in our opinion is a robust solution. We talk about packages, not vulnerabilities over there, and it serves very well. But how do we create a database as that? We use data directly from our stream, the source, that provides us with the highest confident data, which is uh, uh, which is uh, our uh, point of truth. We employ a confidence-based system. That means we don't have uh, all data that we trust. It could be if uh, the vulnerability data is from the maintainers, we can trust it blindly because they have published it's their code. But if it comes from a third party, there is a problem. We cannot uh, give them 100% confidence. There could be certain uh, differences over there. But what we can do is we can aggregate and correlate as many data sources as possible. And then we can cross reference those data sources to make sure the confidence of a particular package vulnerability relationship is uh, as high as it could be. And then we come up with new relations with vulnerabilities, and then we mine the graph, we find out uh, the relations that were not very much apparent in the first place. And this will eventually help us to get correctness with a very high confidence and uh, a review system as well. Let's see, how do we aggregate and correlate many data sources? Well, of course, uh, we collect as many sources as possible. That would include uh, OSB, GitHub, GitLab, and all the open sources out there. We have a common data model where we can cross reference and uh, create graphs. We can have uh, trackers that are specific to certain projects, like uh, Apache, OpenSSL, or bug trackers, change logs, even. We can even track uh, distributions, that is, Debian, Ubuntu, etc. We can have application package trackers and so on and so forth. So we get us uh, data in one common format from all of these sources, and then we create a multi-level refinement. So first we import, which gets inside the advisory staging area. That is uh, just an area that we name inside our code base, which just had, had it just uh, consists of the upstream data. Now, advisory data can be true or false sort of low confidence or maybe uh, just uh, no data at all. We don't uh, care a lot about our staging area, but there is some structured data over there. What happens is when we go over to the next step, there is an improved step. In the improvement, we take all the advisory data and convert them into a relational database of vulnerability package and their uh, relationship between each other, the confidence and etc. We keep the original advisory data, that is the raw data, along with the relationship so that we can get to the root of every relationship. But at the same time, we have 
very specific improvers that can even cross check uh, data sources they can uh, invalidate data sources they can uh, provide confidences for uh, different type of relationship they can even update version ranges if need so be so by this multi level refinement we can simply grab all the sources out there convert into in a very simple format and then improve upon that source and slowly and steadily we get a final output that consists of a confidence and uh, provides us with uh, a very concrete vulnerability and backup relationship so uh, as critic has presented the current state of open source vulnerability databases so uh, now talk about the issue ghost packages right so some packages do not exist anywhere and when i say packages uh, like the package may exist but some versions do not exist anywhere uh, so what's the solution for that we look up at the upstream registries and repositories and check if the package url and versions are correct and they do really exist at upstream lesser data quality yeah some vulnerability sources can be trusted uh, as we have seen uh, the package and vulnerability doesn't exist but are still reported by some of the sources so you can't trust them all so what do we do here we assign confidence levels yeah confidence levels ensure that we are getting all the data but we can mark them with lesser confidence level if the data quality is not so good so we do not trust others we discount the data sources we trust this but more importantly we do not trust ourselves as well we may discount our automated inferences that we are not sure about so now in character missing versions uh as, as a very interesting point that was pointed uh, when talking about the open source vulnerability databases uh, uh you know sometimes it's reported that a package above 1.0 is vulnerable but the, uh, it was according to that condition only that all the packages above 1.0 were vulnerable but after that also some packages would be published so we, it can't be inferred that, uh, that those packages are also vulnerable so solution is that we store version range resolve range and time travel yeah time travel we uh, so let me explain all of these we store version ranges as a compact string we use universe for storing our uh, version ranges and we we resolve those ranges using our library and uh, improvers can do time travel uh, we can check uh, if a package version was vulnerable in past when published so next issue is uh, duplicated data because we are aggregating with multiple uh, data sources and because they exist in the world a lot of vulnerabilities could be duplicates so, and uh, that leads to a lot of noise which is the worst enemy that we can have in the vulnerability database because as noise increases you lose trust in the database you ignore the data that the database is providing you with and you just uh, carry on with something else well, what we can do is introduce aliases with every vulnerability there is a set of things a set of keywords that are common amongst uh, all of its copies for example that could be cvi we are also proposing a one code id that is vulnerable code id but it could be a uh, ecosystem specific different ecosystem would have uh, different type of ids but they have set of aliases that we can refer to in order to combine the data now after combining all of the data we create a vulnerable id to alias relationship so that vulnerable vulnerability has a lot of aliases but that has one vulnerable id which helps in defining relationship between one alias to another alias as well so if you are saying cv1234 i could reference it through the vulnerable well and find out a difference maybe bisect adversity or maybe a different adversity associated with the same vulnerability and it won't be duplicated we'll get all the data at one place without any repetitions in the end we reconcile everything with the help of improvers discussed in earlier steps 
where we uh, improve upon our collected data and uh, merge all the uh, duplicate data into one single relationship. These are not the end of the issues that we face. There are other issues. All the data sources that we encounter are somewhat unstructured, messy, and sometimes even incomplete. Well, uh, there has been a lot of effort towards it, and uh, a lot of organizations have started publishing very uh, structured and uh, very clean data sources for vulnerability adversaries. But uh, it is not the case worldwide. There have been vulnerability adversaries that are published just in human readable text, which is uh, in English, follows English grammar, and uh, is completely alien to computers. And uh, we have a lot of problems over here, but the solution is again to integrate all of the data sources and cross reference them. One data source could help identify a badly formed or unstructured other data source coming with the same alias. In the deep duplication example, we talked about aliases, and that could even help us to structure the unstructured upstream data. And uh, that could pave a way to a very clean uh, vulnerability database. Another issue would be not every data is relevant. Old vulnerabilities on Windows 95 or Windows ME does not uh, help us in any way in the parent era. We, uh, that could be interesting for a few, but in general, that uh, lacks uh, a huge interest. And we are not very much interested in commercial software anyways, because vulnerable code is very much focused on uh, open source data. And uh, we want to make it uh, very much transparent how we are working without a secret source and want to uh, incorporate as many data sources as possible. We want to keep licensing in mind and not want to jump into the realm of commercial software, but uh, that uh, stops us being, from being the universal uh, vulnerability database. But for this, we can let go of some of them. Uh, let go of uh, the uh, past uh, data and uh, move forward with the future. We would have a, a little bit of a problem here. We would have a little bit of a, holes in our database, but uh, I guess we can do with, uh, with those holes we, because uh, in future we need uh, to pave the way for the new software, not the old ones. Hello, this is uh, Philippe Omadan here. I'm just jumping in for one last uh, topic, which is our future plans. I'm, I'm the lead maintainer on uh, Vulnerable Code. And so the first thing we're, we're looking at is all the time adding more primary data source as much as possible uh, going upstream because that's where we find the, the better information which have not been uh, reworded and transformed and uh, remember what, what we talked about the, the telephone game earlier on. The second thing also is adding actual commits that are either fixing or introducing vulnerabilities. They are really useful because they help track if the code you use actually has these vulnerabilities, or if a given package, which may be a derived package, say there's a vulnerability in Zlib, um, it's present in a Linux distro or vendored in a node package. Um, how can you know exactly what's the version? Uh, if you know the exact commit, then you can access the exact bit of code that is effectively introducing or fixing the vulnerabilities and check whether you have the code or don't have the code anymore. Uh, in the same line of thought, we are planning to add Yara rules. So Yara is a, a tool to match patterns in source code and binaries. And once we have commits, we can effectively build rules that could detect the presence of these commits in code. And this would enable much finer grain detection of actual vulnerable code. Beyond this, and that's really important, 
it's sad, but um, we have to have a, a human expert review system, and we're, we're going to build a UI for that. It's not entirely sad, it's expected. I was expecting when we started this project that there would be higher data quality that we could depend on. Um, in practice, as we've said earlier on, we, we've observed a lot of problems and issues with the data quality. And there's really no way but to have a human review these uh, vulnerabilities and how they apply and which package they apply to. Um, last but not least, humans, but also as much as possible, machine learning and, and AI. Um, one specific application that we made some experiments with and, and looks promising is to actually spot inconsistencies and discrepancies. Um, uh, there's another application which is uh, be able to, to do some level of uh, natural language understanding and parsing in security advisories. So you could translate something that says, oh, this vulnerability is uh, applying to this package from version two to version five. Being able to transform that in, the, in an actual version range uh, could be one of the applications there. And, you know, machine learning is great, but rural heuristics go a very long way in many cases. Um, an example, uh, uh, Ritik spent quite a bit of time discussing uh, with the Nginx maintainers of Stream to better understand how they create and form their security advisories. So again, these are the authors and, and maintainers, the, the folks that write the code of Nginx, so they, they know uh, everything upstream because they are the upstream of Nginx. Um, the, the rules and your, the, the approach they take to version Nginx and, and version vulnerabilities and vulnerable ranges is a bit peculiar. There's a lot of things which cannot be guessed. They're, they're not something you can just infer by looking at the things. There's a bunch of heuristics that we, we can gather this way, the good old way, and, and also observing the data, finding patterns, and being able to uh, fit these uh, is, is very efficient. Last but not least, we, we've started a project that we call Vuln Total, like vulnerability total. And the goal here is, is eventually work with other providers of vulnerability data, either willingly or if we cannot get their agreement and the data is public, uh, uh, we will try to work out something that, that can be helped, such that we can compare all the vulnerabilities DB. And think about um, a tool called VirusTotal, um, which is originally a, a tool that was running scans, virus scans against, uh, on one file against many different virus scanners been acquired by Google. Uh, but think about VirusTotal for vulnerabilities. I think that can be a very powerful thing, again, uh, uh, help us in two ways, help everyone, because you, you can then find out if you are really uh, vulnerable for a given vulnerabilities, given a version and, and, and input and packet input, that's one thing. The second thing, it, it will highlight which database is the best. Uh, we hope will come out first, uh, but we don't know. And in the end, it doesn't matter because one thing that's really important here that we may not have talked uh, much about is that the reason why we're doing all this as free and open source code and free and open data is that we think that security is, is like oxygen. It has to be open and free. Uh, you cannot put a tax on oxygen. And that's why we, we, we want to make that the very best. And we may not have the very best tool and data, but at least we are contributing to uh, making this a better, better place and more secure place. That's it. Thank you very much. Bye now. Hey, thank you, Philippe, for letting everyone know about the future plans regarding the Unicorn Code. And if you guys are intrigued by Unicorn Code and want to know more about Unicorn Code or other projects or our parts, you can register for our upcoming webinar on July 21st at the following weekend. And read our blog posts from the code. If you can get more info, 
from here. So uh, if you guys want to help us, you can help us either in kind or cash. You can use our tools and let us know how we can make them better. You can join the conversation at Kitter. We are very much active on Kitter. And you can chat with us on Kitter. You will be getting responses from us very quickly. Uh, and if you want to uh, help us in cash, you can donate at the following link. Yeah, so this is the end of our presentation. I invite you to thank on behalf of Philip, Nitik, and me for joining us here. Uh, yeah, signing off.